if you are starting a business within a business and have you know a leadership position um, even if you don't there's so many things that can distract you mm -hmm. right that you're not able to actually focus on finding a solution for that one problem because you don't do the first thing is you don't prioritize you don't figure out what is most important mm -hmm. in order to do that you've got to figure out what the goal is but if you do not prioritize and you just kind of take things as they come how effective are you at finding a solution that's going to get you either closer to or to your goal? Tyler, you uh, would you categorize yourself as someone who likes to get ahead? Did you say, would you yeah. say you're like a person who likes to get ahead? Yeah, at all costs. Yeah. David, what about you? Would you say you like to get ahead? Yeah. I think I would, I would say I like to I get would, ahead. I would. I would. As well. I would agree with that. I strive you. Yes. and work to get ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, what if I told you to that the best way to get ahead is to do nothing? Uh, I feel like my brain's going to explode <laughs> when you say something like that. Should I elaborate? I think you should. Okay. Okay. Before I do, though, as always, our wellness tip of the week is brought to us by our friends at Sleep Number. And as you are listening to this, we are in sunny and beautiful, well, used to be beautiful, yeah. California at the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Thanks to our friends at Sleep Number. Yep. So we are there right now for three, what, three days at Super yep. Bowl. Do they call it Radio Row? Radio Row, yeah. So we're going to be helping them with their media. They've got a, a, a killer, killer um, set. Then we've got, you know, some podcast mm -hmm. areas, mm -hmm. some video areas, and then just places where we can cuddle up in a bed together. Yeah, and that's exactly great. right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just we got some great interviews mm -hmm. um, that are going to be in the queue that we're going to be launching. I was going to say, the next, the, few, the next few interview episodes you listen to, yep. we will be have done those out yep. here in California. So yep. uh, look out for those. Studio will look a little bit different, and that's why it's because we're out here. Uh, with Sleep Number, and again, as always, we're, we're super grateful to them. Love the partnership. Get yourself to a Sleep Number store wherever you are. Uh, they have stores all over, or uh, go on their website, sleepnumber.com, which is actually the resource mm -hmm. of today's wellness tip. Tyler, I don't know if you knew this, but Sleep Number, on their website, they have a blog section. Mm -hmm. And in this blog section, there's tons of articles and blogs, uh, different wellness type tips. Not all of them are sleep related. In fact, today's is not sleep related. Um, but I pulled this literally from the sleep number website. So getting back to what I was saying, doing nothing says Simon Gottschalk. Don't know how to say that. How would you, how would you sounds pronounce good. it? G-O-T-T-S-C-H-A-L-K. Yeah. Gottschalk? Gottschalk. We'll, we'll say Gottschalk. Put an accent on it just to. <laughs> <laughs> doing nothing says Simon Gottschalk a professor of sociology at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, has benefits for productivity, health, and forming true social connections. Mm -hmm. Let me elaborate even further. There's a lot of research that shows when the brain is at rest and is not distracted by so many different sources of stimulation, then new thoughts are possible. The brain starts thinking differently and starts focusing differently on one's environment, mm -hmm. he says. So actually, this is a thought I've had in the past. When is the last time you sat silently, Tyler, and just let your mind think and be creative and, and brainstorm? When's yeah. the last time you did that? It's been, it's been a long time. And, and this, is a, this is an area that I have tried to focus on for the last mm -hmm. year. Um, Why don't we do that? I mean, think about our day job. Bro. Think yeah. about how much better we would be at our day job if we would sit and just think and let ideas flow Creatively. Yeah. Everything we do is just reaction, right? We just, we're constantly on in react mode mm -hmm. and basing all of our decisions on past experience, which is fine. Yeah. But I don't know about you. Well, we just talked about it. I never sit down and think creatively and just have silence and think, okay, what, what can I do to actually propel myself forward? That's right. Yeah. So I read a book and we've talked about this quite a bit, but I read a book called get your life back mm -hmm. by John Eldridge. It's a, it's a faith-based book, but I was at a point in my life, like, like you said, 
the world was controlling my routine, my schedule. Everyone was telling me what I had to do, and I was constantly playing catch up. I was constantly moving, but I was never, ever, ever getting ahead. Mm -hmm. I literally felt claustrophobic all the time because there was always too much to do. You know, I'd I'd get in fights with my wife because I wasn't there with you know present enough with my kids or with her, and but then it wasn't this, and there wasn't. It's like you never felt like you could win. So I read this book. And it talks, most of it is precisely about that. Mm. Do nothing. Yeah. And, and it's counterintuitive. And, and, here's, and here's the thing. One thing that he doesn't talk about is meditation. The challenge, because I've read other books where that's, that's a big emphasis, where you just sit in the dark and you do nothing. You just mm -hmm. meditate, right? The challenge with it, with me, and I had a coach that was on me for all the time, for two years. You need to meditate. You need to meditate at least 15 minutes a day. You need to do it. The problem is, is that now became a chore that I had to do. And right. so the entire time I'm meditating, I couldn't get to a place where, all right, I'm just thinking creatively. I'm like turning my brain off. So my brain was constantly on. So I wasn't sleeping. I was putting on weight. There was so many things. Well, this book, Get Your Life Back, he talks about something that really connected with me was getting out into nature and getting out. It doesn't have to be like, hey, go out in the woods. But go outside and walk. Mm -hmm. Like when do you ever set time aside to just go walk and just like clear your head and just like, okay, I'm going to actually listen to the birds. I'm going to hear the wind. I'm going to look at the beauty that's around us. And I'm really just going to actually let my mind be present and appreciate the things that are around me. And they're everywhere. Yeah. They well, really are. Well, to live that, I'm actually mentioned this before i'm doing 75 hard mm -hmm. right now and part of it is you have to do a 45 minute workout outside so i'm living How the last has been for you rough <laughs> <laughs> the time we're recording this i believe yesterday was in the low 20s and snowing yep. and sleeting yep. yeah that was horrible yep. and then today it, today's a little better but and we'll talk more about that right we'll come back but, to that but my it, it is amazing during the day when I get outside and I do that workout, if it's a walk, if it's a run, whatever it is, just how much energy it gives me for that afternoon. And then I've even realized in the evenings, so, cause there's sometimes where I can't work out till yeah. at night, yeah. that outdoor workout, but just walking, actually seeing stars, like it's amazing yeah. the, the energy mm -hmm. and the recharge mm -hmm. that it gives you. Yeah. And, and he says doing nothing can seem counterproductive in our goal oriented culture, but doing nothing isn't being lazy. Taking short mental breaks when learning new tasks can improve your memory and ability to learn a new skill, found a recent study by the National Institutes of Health. We're human beings, and we need time to recreate and recharge ourselves, says Gishalk. It's not wasted time. It's time we really need to be able to function and remain sane. So that's what it feels like. You feel like you're sitting there, you're doing nothing. I'm just wasting time. But the idea behind it is no you're actually recharge it's like a phone right yeah. the phone has to be turned off every now and then the computer yeah. has to be turned off every now and then to recharge yeah. to re-energize one thing you did for a little bit right you went and got some tests done and you figured out you were vitamin d deficient um which i think all of us could have told you that yeah but. yeah by looking at my <laughs> but, pasty uh, white skin but one thing that you were doing is you in the middle of the day mm -hmm. you'd go outside and you'd walk now what i think you would do is like oh i'd get on a call and i get some stuff yeah. done but one of the things that um, are very, very productive, if like you're in the office setting, instead of like trying to hammer through everything and just cruise through the day, is block out 20, 25 minutes mm -hmm. and literally go for a walk. Don't bring your phone, don't bring anything. Just go for a walk and watch the increase in productivity when you get back. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so he gives a couple of approaches you can take. Most of these you've heard a hundred times. Number one, disconnect from technology. We've all heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to skate over that because it is important mm -hmm. and putting your phone away putting it you know in a drawer put it in another room it really is crazy when you can just sit there and be present in the moment as opposed to being attached to your phone you and your wife do really something really cool mm -hmm. people come over to your house everybody's got to put their phone in a bucket or mm -hmm. whatever a, bo a little basket box. yeah it's a little box yeah. and you're not distracted by the phone you're actually having conversation I, I guarantee those nights you feel better more community that's right those nights because you're not yeah. distracted by the phone uh, number two, let go after work. If you've had a rough day on the job, it's even more critical to decompress. Uh, according to a, a study published in the Journal of Occupational Health Phys uh, Psychology, uh, if your boss or coworkers are negative or abusive, relaxing right after work can be the key to a better night's sleep. Now, I would say if your 
boss is abusive yeah. <laughs> maybe a better step is find a new boss but <laughs> <laughs> nonetheless decompress uh this one was interesting uh this is for our artistic minds out there doodle away he says doodling increases blood flow to the brain's medial prefrontal cortex the area responsible for regulating our feelings thoughts and actions mm -hmm. according to a preliminary research done by drexel university Doodling, and to a lesser extent, free drawing, free drawing and coloring, activates the brain's reward circuit that controls emotion and motivation. Mm. So all those times that, that teacher said, hey, you know, you're quit messing free around, draw. quit doodling, yeah. just tell them, hey, I'm actually improving my brain function here. Yeah, yeah. Miss, <laughs> Get off miss, my back, hey, miss. Hey, miss teacher lady. <laughs> Get, Get off my back, me. miss. <laughs> uh, skip the binge watching. This is another interesting one, right? It's very I was going to ask, is decompressed, does that count? Yeah, does well, that count? When you binge watch a show? <laughs> Great question. So you think, you would think, hey, it's 9.30 at night, 9 o'clock at night. Let's just throw on a couple of Netflix episodes. Yeah. Let's binge watch. I'm not doing I'll anything, right? I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm just sitting around. Work. So he says, while you may be tempted to tune out with your favorite show, marathon viewing isn't exactly doing nothing. A University of Michigan study found that young adults aged 18 to 25 who binge watch shows regularly suffered fatigue, insomnia, and poor sleep quality even though they reported sleeping seven hours and 37 minutes on average. Mm. So they were still getting a duration of sleep that seems acceptable, yeah. but the quality of sleep wasn't there. Mm. It says if you watch one episode, chances are you might keep going unintentionally. I think we all yeah, I'll there, do that. Right? Yeah. I'm just gonna watch one and then six hours right. later. The researchers found that binge watching kept subjects m mentally alert, which may have contributed to their poor sleep. So again, you feel like you're doing nothing, but your brain's active, right? You're in the story, yeah. you're, you know, you're getting involved, right? So that is not, not necessarily the best avenue if, if relaxing that'd be, and doing nothing. It'd be an interesting like self-study is like, all right, hey, I'm going to watch, you know, three episodes of a show, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, we've got these tools with Sleep Number or mm -hmm. Whoop mm -hmm. is, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to record what my actual recovery was. I'm going to try to get, keep all of the, uh, the variables as close to the same, right? You know, dinner at the same time. That'd be an interesting study. Binge watching, see how my sleep score is or my recovery score is. And then do it without watching. Sleep the same amount of time. Yeah. So alarm. You go to sleep at the same time. Alarm at the same time. Yeah. Want to see? I wonder if there that would be a, a different recovery. Now it's all not necessarily neurological, right? You're not seeing mm -hmm. that, but if that translates to actual yeah. recovery. Well, that's the great thing about these sleep number beds, right? Yeah. Is the have the, you have the actual technology to be able to do your own study right. on your, yourself. You be right. your own lab rat. So yeah. that's pretty cool. So anyway, if, if it sounds counterintuitive, doing nothing can actually get you ahead. So. Hopefully you can apply some of those tips. Uh, moving on to the main portion, though, uh, picking back up where we left off yeah. last week, which was our discussion on leadership. Uh, if you weren't with us last week, pause this now. Go back and listen to last week. We're going through the book Extreme Ownership, which is a book written by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. They are two former Navy SEALs who now have a company that actually goes in and helps other companies with their leadership mm -hmm. and helps their management team and, and grows their team and so these guys are very highly qualified to mm -hmm. speak on the subject of leadership because they've seen tons of examples, not only in war, but now in the business sector as well. Yeah. So last week we talked about five uh, principles, leadership principles. Today we're going to wrap it up with four more yep. principles. But before we do that, we do also want to thank our sponsor, Choctaw yeah, Casino Choctaw, Resort. Yeah, Choctaw Casino and Resort. Uh, we actually just uh, had another catch up with them. And tell you what, there could not be a better partner. Mm -mm. Um, no way. I mean, the things that they're doing uh, up there at the uh, at the actual casino and resort. And, and I don't want to overshadow resort just because I say casino first, mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes it should be switched yeah. because the luxury, the quality, the amenities, um, I mean, really just the overall like entertainment that that venue brings. It's unbelievable. They just finished up the new expansion. And I mean, you've got endless restaurants, whether you want Steakhouse, American, you got a Guy Fieri restaurant, you've got movie theaters, you've got uh, music venues, which again, we could go on and on and on about the list of shows that, that they have there. The like if they will play at American Airlines in Dallas or Staples Center in LA, they'll play at Choctaw because Absolutely. one, the quality of sound is is a, is amazing, but the venue is intimate. It's cool. Um, I mean, the pools. I know right now pools are the last thing that we're thinking of in Dallas, but 
I mean, swim up bars, family friendly. It is, it is not like you wouldn't think to bring your kids to Vegas. I would bring my kids to Choctaw yes. and I'm going to. Absolutely. And so it's just an unbelievable place. And we love the partnership. They're doing great things. They're literally giving away millions, z, z, plural, <laughs> of dollars a month every Saturday. Uh, the, the giveaways that they have are endless. So please, please go check check it out. And what, what do we say? It's just a short drive up I-75. Boom. Or 75, go. whatever you I think you made fun of me last time I said <laughs> I-75. <laughs> <laughs> so get yourself up to Choctaw Casino and Resort. Okay, so last week uh, we went through five principles, which were leaders own everything in their world. Leaders set the standard. Number three, leaders believe in the mission. Four, leaders check their ego. Five, leaders keep it simple. And today, our last four, number six, leaders prioritize and execute. And from the book, he says, on the battlefield, countless problems compound in a snowball effect. Every challenge complex in its own right, each demanding attention. But a leader must remain calm and make the best decisions possible. To do this, SEAL combat leaders utilize, prioritize, and execute. We verbalize this principle with this direction. Relax, look around, make a call. Even the most competent of leaders can be overwhelmed if they try to tackle multiple problems or a number of tasks simultaneously. The team will likely fail at each of those tasks. Instead, leaders must determine the highest priority task and execute. When overwhelmed, fall back upon this principle, prioritize and execute. A particularly effective means of, to help prioritize and execute under pressure is to stay at least a step or two ahead of, a real, of real time problems. Through careful contingency planning, a leader can anticipate likely challenges that could arise during execution and map out an effective response to those challenges before they happen. Mm -hmm. So leadership principle number six, leaders prioritize and execute. What's your thoughts on that? So a handful of things. Obviously, it's it's really easy to see that application in in warfare, right? Mm -hmm. You can say, okay, mm -hmm. hey, there's a million things that can go wrong. You can never fully plan for every scenario. You can do the best. I mean, our military, specifically the SEALs, are as prepared as anyone could possibly be. But let's take this to real life is the prioritize. If you are starting a business within a business and have, you know, a leadership position, um, even if you don't, there's so many things that can distract you, mm -hmm. right? That you're not able to actually focus on finding a solution for that one problem because you don't do the first thing is you don't prioritize. You don't figure out what is most important. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, you've got to figure out what the goal is. But if you do not prioritize and you just kind of take things as they come, how effective are you at finding a solution that's going to get you either closer to or to your goal? Um, so, I mean, really in, in work, unfortunately, one thing that fortunately, unfortunately, right, uh, is that in our business, we could be working on 50 projects at one at one time. Mm -hmm. I got a buddy. I was uh, a good buddy of mine. Uh, he's got 300 open projects, of not course. in our industry, something else, but. Um, but we're working on 50 things. So we have potentially 50 clients calling us needing something. Uh, one thing that has probably stalled my career and probably progress is, uh, is the fact that I just kind of take it as it comes. I'll be in the middle of something. I'll get a call and then, oh, I got to get this out to mm -hmm. them. And then I forget to go back to that. So then I go to the next thing and then I get a call about this and then I got to go there. The challenge with it is I get overwhelmed. I get, it's just like, it's, and then I don't get anything done. Right. And I don't, and I don't solve the problem and I'm not able to actually recognize, okay, Hey, look, what, it, what priority is it right now? What do I need to do? Mm -hmm. And in our industry, right? You do, you do what's most important, not what's most urgent. Right. And there's a difference. There's a difference between what's important and what's urgent. Like I need to spend my time, if I can, on doing the important things, not what's going to make me a buck right now. Mm -hmm. It's about what's going to make wealth in the long in the long term. So figuring out what's important, prioritize, and then just taking a breath. Right? Sometimes you just need to just like relax. It's like we talked about earlier. Yeah. Do nothing. Yeah. It's like okay. <laughs> and then maybe you can see how to prioritize. Right. Maybe yeah. you can see, and then look, and then commit to it, and then go do it. 
don't say, you know, don't prioritize and this is a priority and you know, I'm taking a breath and then it's like, go execute. Yeah. Go do it. Yeah. Commit from that it. reading, he says a particular effective me means to help prioritize and execute under pressure is to stay at least a step or two ahead of real time problems. So what I think of here is it's very easy to wait till the problem arises and then react as opposed to staying ahead of that problem. Yeah. Uh, having a plan, a contingency plan for when, because problems inevitably come. Yeah. And so those that are able to sit there and plan that out and say, okay, when this problem does arise, because there will be yeah. a problem, this is how you've already decided before the moment arrives uh -huh. what you're going to do. Yeah. Our, our friend Andy Frisella talks about the power list. Mm -hmm. And the power list is exactly what this is talking about, prioritize and execute. So Andy, the power list is five critical tasks. You write down first thing every single day, five critical tasks you must get done that day. Yeah. If the whole day falls to shit, at least you got those five things yeah. done. So these things are five critical tasks, like I said, that are going to propel you forward to whatever it is the goal that you're trying yeah. to accomplish. So you at least accomplish those. If you Once you get all those things done, then everything else falls in place. Yeah. But that's what I think about yeah. when I think prioritize and execute is if I have a plan going into each day, the day goes much better that's right. than if I just react all day long. Yeah, and here's, and here's another real life example. Think of parenting. Sure. Think of parenting when you're just reacting to something that your child does, right? And then how effective are you really when, you know, your, your child comes home late from a curfew mm -hmm. or, you, you know, your child disobeys and runs across the street when they shouldn't, whatever the, whatever the scenario is. When then when you're parenting or they ask you, <laughs> never mind, I'm not going to lie. Um, when they ask you like a, a question that you're not even, you're not ready for, right? Like, they ask a sexual question, if they ask uh, a cultural question, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. So in parenting, you prioritize, look, these are the things, these are the foundations, you and your spouse, or if it's you single, figuring it out, or the other parent, hey, we're on the same page, whether you're together or not, but what are the priorities to us? What are we trying to accomplish with our kids? And then you say, all right, now we gotta take a, take a step back and we gotta, all of those things, how are we going to react to those? Mm -hmm. What are the answers we want to give our kids? How are we going to discipline our kids? How are we going to take them and groom them into the person that we're called to groom them into, right? And then go execute. When, when that situation comes, you've anticipated, as parents, right? We say this all the time to our kids. Like, I know what it's like to be 12 years old. I know what it's like to be 8. I know what it's like to be 16. Except... We don't actually plan for that. We don't mm -hmm. take those experiences that we've learned and we don't actually anticipate the things that are gonna happen. So, hey, you and your, you and your spouse, you say, or your co-parent, whatever, whatever scenario is, all right, when they come home late, they break curfew, how are we gonna react to that? Mm -hmm. How are we gonna discipline? How are we going to teach them something from that so that one, it doesn't divide us, two, that they learn something and they're held accountable, but we find a solution for it. And what the meaning is, when you actually talk to a kid and give them a reason why you're doing it so that it makes sense in their head, that's the goal as a mm. parent, right? So if you have a plan parenting, if you, if you prioritize what's important, if you just relax so the scenario doesn't get overwhelming when, when your daughter asks what that thing hanging in the shower is, like you have, or hey, my son, hey, what is this? Why is it getting bigger? You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> <laughs> you have a plan. And, and, and my wife is amazing because she has those proactively, right? Mm -hmm. You're ahead of it. But if you prepare yourself for that scenario and you use your prior experiences because you know it's going to come, mm -hmm. it's like on these, on these missions that, that Jocko's talking about. They've been in a million missions, right? Millions of mi missions combined behind, through the Navy SEALs and our military. So look, we're going to call on those experience on how to anticipate what's going to happen ahead of time. And then you, it happens and it's like, all right, second yeah. nature. Yeah. I love it. Prioritize and execute. Number seven, leaders identify clear directives. From the book, he says, what's the mission? Planning begins with mission analysis. Leaders must identify clear directives for the team. Once they themselves understand the mission, they can impart this knowledge to their key leaders and frontline troops tasked with executing the mission. A broad and ambiguous mission results in a lack of focus, ineffective execution, and mission creep. To prevent this, the mission must be carefully refined and simplified so that it is explicitly clear 
and specifically focus to achieve the greater strategic vision for which that mission is a part. Once the detailed plan has been developed, it must then be briefed to the entire team and all participants and supporting elements. Leaders must carefully prioritize the information to be presented in a simple, clear, and, conci and concise format as possible so that participants do not experience information overload. The planning process and briefing must be a forum that encourages discussion, questions, and clarification from even the most junior personnel. If frontline troops are unclear about the plan and vet, and yet are too intimidated to ask questions, the team's ability to effectively execute the plan radically decreases. Thus, leaders must ask questions of their troops, encourage interaction, and ensure their teams understand the plan. So, Where does your mind first go to so when you important. hear that? For sure, football. Yep. Um, there's a ton of there's a ton of business analogies and mm -hmm. parenting analogies. Um, so I'm going to go football and parenting. I'm going to go back to parenting again. Uh, so football, an offensive coordinator, an offensive staff. Okay, so typically, well, let's just go through a typical week. You go through a game, and you have uh, you've worked on a game plan for three weeks prior to that game. Okay, so two weeks ahead of time, the quality control guys, the assistant coaches, they're starting to do scouting. They're starting to put their scouting report together. So they're usually a couple weeks ahead. And then the offensive coordinators will get involved. Usually like Friday, Saturday, when things slow down, they'll watch for the week ahead so that they, okay, hey, I'm starting to put some things together. How do we implement our playbook into this? How do we create new things? So then you go to the game, you debrief the last game, and then the coaches spend an entire day working on the game plan together, right? Putting in the plan of action. Mm -hmm. Okay, what plays are we gonna call? Who, do, who are we gonna attack? Where are their weaknesses? Where are their strengths? Wh what are our strengths? And, and then you come up with a plan of attack. So then you go typically into a Tuesday meeting. For us, it was Tuesdays. You go to Tuesdays. And Tuesdays, afternoons, hey, we're introducing it in a very simple, we're gonna talk, okay, who are the people that you're playing against? What are their traits? Uh, what are their stats? What are their weaknesses? Um, and, you, and you brief it. But here's how it goes. Is, is it typically, right, the head coach will oversee the entire game plan. And then the offensive coordinator, now he is, his job, offensive defensive coordinator and special teams coordinator, is their one phase. They're in charge of that. So then it goes down to position coaches. Now, position coaches, and you talk about simplifying it. As it goes down the line, it goes head coach, coordinator, position coaches, players and typically there's two tiers there's starters and then there's the utility Scrubs. guys I say I'm <laughs> NFL reference right yeah. but you've got those and then scout guys so you've got three levels of players now everybody has to be on the same page yep. so in order to do so the head coach has to be very clear what he wants his offensive coordinator to accomplish that week okay then the offensive coordinator has to create a plan that is effective, accomplishes the head coach's goal, that his position coaches can understand, digest well enough to be able then to teach, to teach his players. Mm -hmm. So that then the players understand it enough, not to only to execute, but teach the younger players. So there's this chain, right? And you've yes. got to be very clear and concise. Now, the transition to... Well, before we transition to parenting, think about that scenario. And you think, oh, the scout team guy, what's the big deal? The head coach, you know, he knows what's going on. What's, what's it really matter if the scout team guy knows? Because you think in this scenario, the scout team guy's the lowest man on the totem pole. Yeah. But imagine if there's a team of scout team guys that have really no clue what the aim is for that day. Or even that play, if you want to yeah. boil it down all the way to specific. You know, if they're in practice, they're not really sure what you're being trying to. That is a major problem because yeah. those guys are vital to yeah. get the team ready right so if the most junior guys on the team in this scenario the scout team guys if they don't understand the plan if they're not clear on the plan that affects everybody and that ultimately bleeds up back to the leader which is the head coach yeah well and what's crazy is like you say yes yeah, scout team guys are the low man on the total but i mean i'll take it a step further right equipment staff they've got to know that week because they've got to set up the drills exactly. that are specific to that yep. week yeah. the trainers have to know what the goals are that week because they've got to make sure that this guy's ready for this that guy's ready for this he's present for that i mean everybody yeah. in the organization has to be on the same page so that again it goes overriding goal right so that's like a, a general coming in and saying hey guys our goal is to go out and take Osama, Osama bin Laden. All right, cool. Well, then the lieutenants and commanders and, 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 and again, I'm 
don't know the ranks perfectly, but <laughs> right, they've got to then go create the plan. So typically in the in, in the NFL, right, head coaches general coordinators get very very detailed on plans. Position coaches understand that that mm -hmm. complicated plan. Now there's the nuances of the execution and the details down to the step, down to the hand placement, down to I mean the very very details. It gets really complicated, but then you got to be able to dumb it down from there mm -hmm. so that everybody understands it and yep. everybody is set up for success. And that's my transition is and, and guess who pays for all that if they're not the head coach. The head coach, right. the leader of the team. Well, usually, yeah, usually the scrubs take the. Wow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what what the coaches are doing by creating this complex yet simple to understand plan is they're setting up. If you are clear with the goals, clear with the understanding what what you're supposed to do and your job, you're setting those players up for success on Sundays. So same thing with kids. Tiffany and I do this everywhere we go with our kids. Is the entire car ride is we set our kids up for success. So if we're going to dinner, okay, kids, we're not asking for a soda. Mm -hmm. We're gonna behave. We're gonna set the example of what a kid should behave. Hey, this, these are the people that we're going to. Here are the kids, here are the expectations. If you don't I meet those that. expectations, here's the consequence. Because here's the deal. If you just be like, hey kids, be good. Yeah, what does that's that mean? That's ambiguous, they yeah. don't know. What does that mean? Like very clearly is, hey, Rocco and Sia, you are going to sit next to mommy and daddy because we know that sometimes food gets <laughs> food gets lost, right? It ends up everywhere. So we're not going to do that tonight. Hey, Gia and Luca, do not ask for sodas because we're we, we're not having sodas at dinner. Mm. Whatever it may be, right? And we walk it through and we set them up for success because if they don't know what is expected of them there, they're never going to do that. That's really ever. good. Yeah. So again, if you have a plan and you and you. Make sure that you are relaying it in a way that they can process it. Because you may feel, and how many coaches, how many bosses, how many teachers do we have that like want to make it super complicated? And they, 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 they sound smart and they, and they give all this information out and they've checked their box and they feel smarter than you. But mm -hmm. guess what? You look like an idiot because the people that you're leading don't know what to do. And if it's not clear and dumbed down in a way they can understand, you could have... It doesn't matter what you tell them. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think of bosses I've had that it wasn't m malicious. No. But they didn't dumb it out, down, down enough. And now me as a junior person, I'm too embarrassed to ask because yeah. I think I should know this yeah. because of the way they're speaking to me yep. as a matter of fact. Yep. And so now I'm sitting here as a follower, as a junior person, thinking I'm... I'm an idiot for I'm not an idiot. That. I'm confused. Whereas all the leader had to do was just r dumb yeah. it down. Yeah. I would say... You're probably going to be okay dumbing it down more than you think you should. More, I would agree. Err on the side of this is way elementary. Simplify it more as opposed to thinking. Oh, it, anytime you start assuming, yeah. And that was one of my biggest flaws as a manager is I would assume things, yeah. and then when something didn't get done the way that I needed to get done, yeah, I would be confused as to why it didn't get done. But yeah. the the flaw there was that I didn't dumb things. I I just assumed they knew. Yeah. And you can't do that as a leader. Yeah. And you as can't a, make the assumption that the people that you're trying to lead know exactly what you, you have to tell them. And then also too, like you, and this is where I think the emotional intelligence comes in is you've got to be able to interact with your team in a way that you create an environment that when you give them the opportunity to ask questions, which you always need to always mm -hmm. clarify, let them repeat back the expectation that you have put on them so that you know that they understand it. Man, I do it all the time with my kids. Like, Okay. Yes. Repeat. <laughs> yes. Please repeat what I just yeah. asked you. 90% of the time. Oh, I don't know. I wasn't listening. <laughs> you just said yes. You right. just said yes, sir. Yeah. What do you mean? Repeat it. Cause I want and, you to shut up, but yeah. you have to, you have to come up with, you have to create an environment that maybe the juniors or the practice squad guys or the scrub, whoever it is that they feel comfortable asking questions and then have them reaffirm it. Mm -hmm. It has to, if, if, if a boss of ours and we've got a ton of great bosses, but if they're like, all right, is there any questions? I've got no issues asking a question. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, because they've created an environment where I don't feel stupid just because I don't know something. Right. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's better to, it's better to look stupid internally than to look stupid externally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. Okay. So leaders identify clear directives. Number eight, leaders are calm in the chaos. This one might be my favorite one. 
then we could go on for days about this one. But from the book, he says, leaders cannot be paralyzed by fear. That results in an action. It is critical for leaders to act decisively amid uncertainty, to make the best decisions they can based on only the immediate information available. There is no 100% right solution. The picture is never complete. Leaders must be comfortable with this and be able to make decisions promptly, then be ready to adjust those decisions quickly based on evolving situations and new information. Does that sound familiar in the last two years of our yes. uh, lives on, on, on earth here? Waiting for 100% right and certain solutions leads to delay and decision and inability to execute. Outcomes are never certain. Success, never guaranteed. Even so, leaders must be comfortable in the chaos and act decisively amid such mm-hmm. uncertainty. Yeah. I don't think we can think of any examples of that, can we? Zero. <laughs> Zero. I'll just high, high level. High level is if, if you are embarking on a mission or a task or a job or a phase and you go into it with the mindset that there is going to be a problem. And I've had I've had pastors um, share with me like, listen, w- when you're in prayer, pray for adversity. Like, why would you pray for that? Like if, because if you're praying for it, you're expecting it and you're ready to handle it, but then you also know that you're growing from it too. Mm-hmm. So if you expect adversity, you expect changes, you're not surprised. You're not surprised and you're not paralyzed when those challenges or adversity come. And if, if you're just in the mindset, now there's a line between being pessimistic and expecting adversity, right? There's those people, right? That just ex- expect everything to go wrong and the world mm-hmm. is falling. Like there's a difference, right? But if you're just anticipating, and again, through experience, through knowledge, through mentors, through resources is, all right, what, what, uh, um, what detours may, may come here? Mm-hmm. What can I anticipate? Yep. I'm going to anticipate certain things. So I'm going to leave 50% of my focus on things that I know could possibly happen. But then also the other 50%, hey, I've got to be able to react, man. I got to be able to flow with this because you can never anticipate everything. Right. And if you wait to anticipate everything, like he said, you're never going to start. Yeah. Well, the other thing is it hinders performance for those that you're leading. So my first boss out of college was now he had had some certain medical issues that – prevented him from thinking clearly sometimes and I won't go into all that but he was the king of when things got chaotic he was as fran- like Lost way his, more frantic yeah. and frust- would get frustrated super easy and what does that do for us as the people working for him our performance suffers right yeah. because we never know when he's going to fly off the handle we never know what's going to tip him off this time and so we're constantly walking on eggshells trying to perform yeah but when he, when, when things are chaotic, you need that, you need to look to somebody yeah. that you need that person, that steady person yeah. who stays calm in that chaos. Yeah. And unfortunately in that scenario, that wasn't our boss. Mm-hmm. It had to be somebody else. So we're sitting there as, as followers wondering, you know, how do we react to this? How do we perform? But I think of coaches I've had during games, right? That's the easiest example. Yeah. Games not going the way you want it. Yeah. Some coaches are screaming and yelling and throwing a fit. Yeah. Other coaches are just as calm as can be. They're not getting too high on situations. Yeah. They're not getting too low. Yeah. They're just staying nice and even keeled. And those are the coaches that you perform better for. Yeah. Those are the bosses you perform better. Composure, those are the parents you can follow better. Composure is contagious. It's huge. You know? It's if you can, if you can hold it together. Think, and we all, like everybody listening to this right now, you could probably think of three to five people in your life that you are like, hey, look, if it goes down, I want them by my mm-hmm. side because mm-hmm. they are they are freaking cool as a cucumber in those situations. Like they're the person that you're like, all right, I know that they'll be good in this. Yeah. Yeah. Like we all know those people. Yeah. Like they're like, okay, if it goes down, that's who I want to be next to. All right. Well, I think of Darren, since he's not here, we can talk about him like this. Yeah. But you know, Darren's a partner in our firm, so he's one of the one of our leaders of our yeah. firm. And I think about the COVID pandemic and everybody was super unsure what what do we do next how do we adjust what do we and i just think of darren how calm he was in that scenario now on the inside i'm sure he was freaking out just like everybody else he was uncertain but what he showed us was strong leadership and so we knew hey everything's gonna be okay because we have that guy leading us and and the rest of the partners as well obviously 
but it really it really does dictate and set the tone for your team yeah. how you react to things how you react to chaos that sets the entire tone for the entire That's team. That's right. And, and you just limit your ability to make rational, logical, effective decisions. When you are emotional, when you're, when you're heightened emotionally, like you just don't think clearly. I mean, I think that's, that's super obvious, but like, just think of, think of in, in a job, right? A, a, a project's going sideways, a deal's going sideways. Um, you know, an account is going sideways when, it's just freak out, freak out, blame everybody, blame everybody. And that's the only thing you can come up mm -hmm. with in your mind because you are not calm and collected about it. As opposed to you just wasted an hour of everybody's time dog cussing everybody out why they didn't do this. Hey, you could have spent that hour saying, okay, hey, look, let's find a solution to this. Yeah. Like, you know, we'll, we'll figure out what went wrong, why it went wrong later. But right now we need to figure out, okay, hey, what's the next step to either, you know, recover or, um, you know, recuperate whatever it is as a team, business, sports, life, whatever it is, so that we can make progress and get out of this. Yeah, I think of Jeremy Andrews, who we just interviewed, the Traeger CEO. Yeah. And one of the things he said was about the pandemic, you know, when COVID hit, was this is a really interesting problem that the world has never seen before yeah. that I'm intrigued to yeah. try to solve. Yeah. And I thought in that moment, oh, that's a leader right that's there. That's right. He doesn't look at this problem as something like, oh no, you know, why us, poor us. He's sitting there thinking, how can we solve this? This is intriguing to me. This is exciting. He was actually excited about now uh, again, on the inside, he's probably just as scared as everybody else. Yeah. But on the outside, he's exuding this confidence yeah. of, now this is something we get to solve. Yeah. And that's the leaders that you want to work yeah. for. And, and again, reemphasize what you just said. It's okay to be to have that's fear and to be hundred percent normal. To be fearful. It's it's okay. But don't let that overcome you. And don't let that take over all of your rational thinking. Mm -hmm. Yep. So leadership principle number nine, last one we're going to discuss to wrap up this book. Leaders know when to follow. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to wrap up this one. It's good. Because of that. I mean, it says it all it's right best. there. Leaders know when to follow. And Jocko says, a leader must lead, but also be ready to follow. Sometimes another member of the team, perhaps a subordinate or a direct report, might be in a better position to develop a plan, make a decision, or lead through a specific situation. Perhaps the junior person has greater expertise in a particular area or more experience. Good leaders must welcome this, putting aside ego and personal agendas to ensure that the team has the greatest chance of accomplishing its strategic goals. A true leader is not intimidated when others step up and take charge, how good so is that? important, so important. I mean, in what we do, so the structure of our business is typically, I would say, many times, right? There's an account lead. There's somebody that created the relationship, solidified the business. They started it, right? That's it's their account. I'm throwing up air quotes if you're just listening, right? It's their account. Um, there's so many times the reason we work in teams, the reason we do things in, in with our company is, is because there's different levels of expertise. Mm -hmm. There's different levels of experience. There's different perspectives on how to work through that problem or s solve X. And I mean, there's been, I can't tell you how many times that like, it's my account, my account. And the ego says, no, 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 you need to be the one talking with the yeah. person. You need to do this and you need to do that. When I, when I do that problem, it never goes good. Never. Mm -hmm. But there's times it's like, okay, look, I'm going to let someone else. How do we do this? Or, Hey, talk to the client. Like you, you come in from another angle and bring in your expertise, bring in your knowledge. And it makes that project so much better. Mm -hmm. And there's times that I'm like, no, 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 no. What are you doing? Emailing them? Like I'm supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. And I've got to catch myself. And it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Like they're, they are just as or more qualified, and that's great because what's the ultimate goal? It's not if I had the direct line of contact every time. Right. It's, hey, are we going to get this, this across the finish line and get our client into a great new space? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the goal, right? Yep. So if you say, look, I've got to do everything. It's got to be my idea. i got to get credit for it. i got to do all this, and your ego blocks you from all the resources that you have on your team then go start your own business and work by yourself. Right. Like don't, don't claim to be a leader. Yeah. Let those people speak up, bring those into account. You may not always use them, 
but let those people feel comfortable in bringing in ideas, new perspectives, new solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Another good example of this when I was, you know, I mentioned this before when I was a, a personal training manager in my previous career. So the way it worked out or the way it was set up was there were two of us managers over this particular gym. One of them, the, the person ahead of me was in charge of all trainers, every single trainer in that gym. That, that was her jurisdiction. For me, I was head of the newer trainers. So the five or six brand new hires, the ones that we're trying to onboard and, and bring up. And so this scenario plays out perfectly uh, in this example. So we had a young trainer, new trainer to us, and but his skill set, he was a trainer previously. He wasn't your typical brand new hire. This guy still to this day is one of the most phenomenal mind training minds I've ever known in my life, younger guy than me. But just for whatever reason, training clicked for him. And he was obsessed with it. And he knew everything about it. And so, but he was a new trainer, right, at our, at our club. And so it would have been really easy for me because we would have weekly meetings with our, our newer, newer trainers. And he would say something that I didn't either A, know, or B, maybe I said it wrong and he was correcting me. It would have been very easy in that scenario to let my ego come into play and say, no, you're new to this. You don't know. Yeah. But what I would do is I would submit to that and I would realize, no, he actually, he has more expertise in this particular area. Yeah. The other trainer on the other hand, or the other manager on the other hand, had a big problem with this. And for whatever reason, the ego was just too much and she couldn't submit to that. She couldn't get that under control. Yeah. And so they would butt heads quite a bit because she couldn't stand the fact that he knew probably more. I, I, and again, I, I get it. I totally understand. I get the, the temptation is, well, no, I'm in this position. I earned this position. So whatever I say goes, yeah. whereas the best course of action would have been to take that younger trainer's advice on yeah. that certain situation. Yeah. So that's what I think of is, yeah. is it's hard though, right? Cause you, you earn that position for the most part, you probably earn that position of leadership most of the time. Yeah. And, or in this scenario we did. And so it's hard to think, Oh, I've got to take a step back here and I've yeah. got to be, got to be led as opposed yeah, to. Yeah. So there's my, my father-in-law uses this all the time and he's, he's been in the car business for a long time long time and there's this concept of self-preservation where the bad leaders are focused on self-preservation so mm -hmm. if there's a threat from below somebody that can add value that they don't or can't or won't that they will then squash that person's confidence mm -hmm. squash their credibility squash whatever so that they it's a direct competition yeah so yeah. that they can hold on to whatever they've held on to and typically that person brings zero value mm -hmm. and they know it but they're trying to hold on to that job and that salary and that position and that that um, that influence. And so self-preservation is one of the worst things that you can have in your culture. If you have people that are focused on just keeping their job and they're going to they're going to discredit or they're going to take credit from somebody else or they're going to silence a voice and I'm going to put you down or I'm or I'm not I'm not even going to train you or pour a, you know, wisdom into you, yeah. things that help me get to where I is. Because here's the deal, the leaders, and, and, and I'm telling you this, the leaders that have the awareness of, look, I'm, I'm all about growing other people below me, lateral, even above me. Those are the people that continue to climb because those are people that want, people want around. The well, people that create good culture and that let the younger people, but if you're just hoarding your position, doing as little as you can, and all your effort is into taking down other people because you're not giving them the credit to mm -hmm. do it and not following the lead of someone else like that that is the worst thing that you can have for culture that, that's such a good point because think about again your mind says this younger person this junior person to me i need to know more than them always or else they're a threat to me mm -hmm. but the reality is my bosses yeah it's it is my job to grow this junior person yeah. And if this junior person has a good idea that helps the team, yeah. it makes me look better. It doesn't make me yeah. look worse because our performance improves. Yeah. But it's hard to think in that scenario. Well, now, obviously, if that continues to happen, you're yeah. constantly being shown up. That's, that's yeah. one thing. But if the whole team's performance improves, guess who gets the credit for that? Yeah. The leader. Because here's the deal. Leaders are just coordinators. Right. I hate to say it. Yeah. Like, yes, like leaders, if you are a leader – your specific expertise of details of whatever that role is, 
is less important than maybe someone below you because the further down you go, the more you just become a doer. Mm -hmm. I mean, lack of better term, right? So as you are getting influence and you're in leadership roles, if you can coordinate other people and look, if you're, if you're that leader and I just think about this, like think about who you want as a boss is a boss. that's like, Hey Ben, Dude, that was a great idea. You know what? What I want you to do this week, I want you to get up in front of the team. I want you to talk about that. And I want you to I want you to head up this project. Yeah. You sit in the back and you just are there to support. You are there to say, hey, you need something from me? Okay, cool. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna I'm gonna find an answer for you. I'm gonna get a solution for that. I'm gonna get that resource for you. Okay, cool. Now, what are you thinking of me as a leader? Like, this is the best yes, freaking boss absolutely. ever. He's empowering me. He's encouraging me. He's getting me the resources. Giving me responsibility. And guess what? Yeah. Your team is doing something. So now your bosses think you as a leader are this magic, <laughs> this wizard, right? And you're creating things because you're letting other people do it. Yes. And you're following the lead. And then the other thing I think of is, and Darren talked about this earlier, is, is we won't get down in the dirt. As leaders, we don't mm -hmm. think we need to get down on the dirt. The best leaders are the ones that are like, hey, uh, hey, junior partner or, or junior associate, you know what? Let's get down. I'm going to build that Excel sheet with you. Or guess what? I'm going to go put mortar in between these bricks. I know that I'm the boss, but I'm going to actually go lay these bricks with you. Or I'm going to go cut wood. Or I'm going to, like, we had a general contractor at our house, um, brought in all these subs. He didn't have to do anything. Didn't have, he could literally just tell them what to do, mm -hmm. how to do it, when to be done. This guy is out there on his hands and knees laying thin set under tile. He's out there cutting boards for the framers. He's out there uh, uh, like uh, smoothing out stucco. I mean, he's literally doing all of these things with these guys. And guess what? That's the best contracting experience that I've ever had. And I've referred him to dozens of people right. because he was willing to get down and follow the lead of these subcontractors That's that awesome. probably know more about that specific trade than he does. Right. Cause he's, he's like you said, he's a coordinator. Yeah. He's not a specialist in any no. one of those. There. He knows enough to be dangerous, Yeah, yeah. but good for him to realize that yeah. hey, these guys are specialists. And think of these They're subs, the, the hardest part in like the general contracting world right now is finding subs. Mm-hmm. If I'm a sub and I'm like, all right, this GC one, you know, he's going to pay me fairly, but he's also down there with me yeah. doing it. Yeah. And I'm telling him what to do. And he's Somebody. listening. I don't think less of you because I told you what to do. It's, I think more of you because the humility that you bring to this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, that's, that's, to me, that's a, the best way to end. Yeah. And that's, yeah. the, that's, it's fitting that he ended. Mm -hmm these principles with that. So to recap the last two weeks, leaders own everything in their world. Leaders set the standard. Leaders believe in the mission. Leaders check their ego. Leaders keep it simple. Leaders prioritize and execute. Leaders identify clear directives. Leaders are calm in the chaos. And leaders know when to follow. So good, man. What, what closing so good. thoughts you got? Man, I would just say, you've got to go get this book, right? We hope that we shared yes. some things that help. Um, but this book is so good. And how it's structured is, is kind of how we do the show a lot of times. And, and, and we'll make a football example or a business example, you know, football example to a business example. Um, he does this. Every single lesson starts with a mission, a real life mission that he's gone through. How it played out, how that leadership quality played out in that miss mission, whether it was there or it wasn't. And there's times that it's success and there's times that it's terrible failures. Um, and then he'll take it over to a real life business example that they use with, through Echelon Front, his business consult, his business consulting business. Consulting group, yep. Um, and so they go in and he, there's literally problems that like it'll, and, and he it explains it perfectly and the advice that he gives to these leaders in these businesses that he's working with, it's unbelievable yeah. and it makes more sense in the world. So it's a very easily digestible book that you can take and use in, in whatever phase of life, whether it's parenting, whether it's business, whether it's sports, whatever it is, this is an unbelievable book. So I highly recommend you going and getting it. Yeah. Yeah. The book is unbelievable. If, if leadership is, is important to you, which should be yeah. important to all of us. Another great resource of Jocko's his podcast yeah. And he does, he does various types of episodes. Yeah. You know, one episode, it'll be, you know, three or four hour interview with a former, you know, veteran of some sort. Uh, another one, he calls it the Jocko underground and he'll just throw out different topics. And then, but the one that refers to leadership, it's called the debrief. Mm -hmm. And that's where he and his partner, 
discuss actual lives. Now yeah. they change names and, and yeah. things like that to conceal identity, but they actually discuss real life problems that they see in their consulting group with yeah. real companies. Yeah. And they took two, three, four examples each episode. And I'm telling you, it is the best 30 minutes yeah. on leadership. Again, the book is an unbelievable resource, but that podcast, seriously, if you're in a leadership position, that seriously. is a must listen to his podcast yeah. because it's real life scenarios, how he's helping real leaders get better at their job. And, yeah. and every single time I'm not even, again, I'm not even in a leadership position and at work anymore. Now I'm a parent, that's a leadership position, but I take away something on every single one of those episodes. Right. So absolutely. If you're a, if you're a leader somewhere, yeah. those are and just overall to. leadership guys is, is we have a decay of leadership across the board. We have a decay of leadership in parenting. We have a decay of lead. And I'm you know what? No, I'm going to specifically, we have a decay of leadership in men. Mm -hmm. uh, men in the homes. We have a decay of leadership. I mean, it, we can go into this, but we have a decay of leadership politically. Uh, we have a decay of leadership uh, just culturally. We just, we, we desperately need to implement these traits into our country right now. Yes. So the more of you that read this and adopt these principles, the better off we're all going to be. And guess what? In leadership, one of the main things that you can understand is in order to lead, I've got to follow that last point. So guess what? I can control me. I can control myself. I can become a better, everybody can become a better leader. Everybody, Absolutely. no matter what phase of life you are, if you write Jocko can say, I can become a better leader. Oh, definitely. So again, implement these, grow your, grow yourself so that you can lead others into better places. And we need this desperately. Well said. Well said. Uh, support us, guys. Yeah. Follow us on Instagram at one.shot.pod. Follow us on YouTube, One Shot Podcast. Uh, rate and review. That's yes. huge. That helps us reach more people. Every time you rate us, uh, five stars preferably, preferably, and leave us a review that just that shows the algorithm, that shows the, the uh -huh. whatever podcast platform you listen on, that shows this is a good show. This needs to reach more people. So right. help us out in that way. Text some friends. If, if yeah. you got something out of this episode or any episode. It's easy to share. share. Yeah, easy share to with share. Just hit those dots. Go to share. Yep. Send it in a text. Yep. I do it all the time. It's, yeah. I mean, I just literally send it to my entire phone book every, <laughs> every week. Just, hey, bro, great episode this hey, week. Hey, bro, we were awesome A lot this of self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so help us out, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, the, gr the show's growing every month yep. at this point, and, yep. and it's all because you guys are sharing. We really, really appreciate you. Uh, have a great rest of the week. We'll enjoy the sun in California, uh, and we'll be back in Texas soon. But have a great rest we'll of the ready. week. Here's the deal. We're going to be ready to come back to Texas, I yeah, guarantee you. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take me home. Have a great rest of the week. Appreciate you guys.